and for my most special grandson. Oh, God. Freaking every year, man. Every year. <laughs> Eat my shorts, suckers. All right, Gramps, what do you got for me? I want you to have the sealed envelope. Oh, uh, a letter. Gee, thanks. You, you shouldn't have. No, no. Holy oh, wow, it's a farm. Thanks, Grandpa. Man, you're the best there dying Grandpa guy could ask for. You, uh, so, um, uh, where uh, is it exactly, oh, Grandpa? I forgot. Grandpa? Oh, uh, maybe he wrote I it down. Uh, let's see here. Oh, On the coast? Star do Valley. Oh, Grandpa, I don't know where that is. You're gonna, you're gonna tell me where it's at, right, Grandpa? Ooh, Grandpa, hey, hold on. Grandpa. Grandpa! Grandpa! Hey guys, and welcome back to another episode of me trying to make the fictional world a bit more real. Thankfully, it does look like our main character eventually made it to the farm, but what about if you wanted to go to your own Stardew Valley? Well, you're in luck, friend. That's kind of what I do here. And I guess offer tourist advice and challenge fictional characters to a proverbial arm wrestling match. But that's not the focus today. We've found a few real life video game places before, so let's hop into this game and see what clues we can find to help put it on our map. The life sim slash dungeon crawler slash dating sim game that is Stardew Valley has quite a bit for us to look at. So like always, we're gonna start with its geography. Starting broad and narrowing our focus as we go. And just in case you're wondering, we're gonna use the standard farm layout since some of these options could really alter where we place it. The first clue we have is located in the letter, but also pretty obvious from the map. This place is near a coast. A south one to be specific. Aside from that, once you're on the bus, you pass this sign that lets you know how far away you are in miles. Also, from the map, we can see it has rivers, mountains, forests, and far up north, a desert. Quite an impressive little gaggle of features included in a relatively small space. But wait, there's more. Once you help Willy fix up his boat, you can visit No Soul Island, which lies just off the coast a bit. And in fact, it's not alone. From the short travel cutscene, a few islands can be seen. So add another one to our list. And now that we have a few things on our geography bingo card, let's expand on one specific one. That being the mountains. Aside from housing some very aggressive flies, it's also home to five different ores. Copper, iron, gold, iridium, and um, radioactive. Since this is such a big aspect of the game, ideally we'll find some place that also mines for these ores. The next feature we want to take a magnifying glass to is the forests. There are only a few trees native to Stardew Valley. Those being oak, pine, and maple. I'm not going to consider the mushroom tree, because, I mean, it's a mushroom tree. And the mahogany tree is only native to No Soul Island. So we preferably would find all of these trees, since, again, wood is fairly important to fixing up your newly acquired farm. Thankfully, this is made a bit easier for us with the plant hardiness scale. I'll avoid going all Evan Hansen on you with my tree nerdage, but in essence, each type of tree can only realistically be expected to thrive in certain environments. Too hot or too cold, and it's not going to stand a chance, or at least not do as well. This scale gives trees a score range based on which side of the spectrum they prefer. Maple has a hardiness range of 4 to 9, oaks is 7 to 10, and pine is 3 to 8. Oak brings our acceptable range up quite a bit to the point where we were looking at a range of just two areas, 7 to 8. A bit tight, but that should be helpful if we need to narrow down our search a bit. Now you might be expecting me to do the same thing with the plants that you can grow, but there's a lot of them, and this is gonna get real boring real quick. So let's just say your character has a really green thumb and avoid getting too lost in the sauce, queen. Instead, for now, I think that should do it for geography, so let's move on to our other metric, climate. Climate's always a bit tricky, and Stardew is unfortunately no different. As always, we're going to use Copen's climate classification to help narrow down our potential real-world matches. This system uses two main things to identify climates, temperature and precipitation. Stardew doesn't do a good job at throwing us a bone when it comes to temperature with the lack of a thermostat, but it does give us a lot of precipitation data, which is nice. While the amount that it rains and snows changes from year to year and by playthrough to playthrough, I'll use one year of my playthrough as the average. Ideally, you take the average of like 30 years, but this video has to come out eventually. 
So on year one, it rained seven days in spring, five days in summer, nine days in fall, and snowed 16 days in winter. So with the limited information we have, let's see which of the five coping classes we can eliminate. Tropical requires a year-round average temperature of 64 degrees Fahrenheit or higher, which is ruled out thanks to winter. On the opposite side, we have polar, which requires an average below 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And again, while there's no thermostat in-game, the spring and summer months definitely don't give off sub-50 vibes. The area class is pretty cut and dry. Sorry. It's defined by a low precipitation rate, and that's definitely not Stardew. So right there, that leaves us with only temperate and continental as viable choices. And it's worth pointing out that these two are fairly similar. Their temperature ranges tend to be close, and they both focus on when the rainy season occurs. The only real difference is whether the coldest month has an average that dips below freezing or not. This is where we run into our first problem. I can't confidently say whether winter ever averages below freezing, so I can't choose one over the other. That would leave us with far too many options, but thankfully there are other ways we can narrow it down. As I mentioned before, both of these focus on when the rainy season is to further divide them up. It either occurs in the summer, winter, or there's no real difference. Going back to our Stardew rain count we looked at before, it's pretty clear to see when its rainy season is. Fall and winter really spike up compared to the rest, and in case there's any doubt, although I called it a rainy season, snow counts. So already that helps narrow our list of 21 options down to just the 7 that have a winter rainy season. Much more manageable. And that should do it. Let's combine all we know and see what we get. First off is the sign that was in miles from the opening cutscene. There's only 3-ish countries where that could be. Liberia, Myanmar, and the good old US of A. Plus, sometimes the UK, which I don't really get, but okay, so that narrows it down quite a bit. In those four countries, we're gonna be looking for a place on a coast with at least one island nearby, mountains, and a desert somewhat close. We also have the Tree Hardiness Index, which shows us that only the US and the UK have areas 7 or 8 in their borders. Liberia's lowest is around 11 or 12, meanwhile, Myanmar's lowest is 9. Now let's go ahead and mix Copen into this, and we can see that the UK doesn't have any of the regions we need, so that leaves just the United States. But where specifically on the west coast? Well, my best guess is Washington state, and here's why. It matches up with everything else so far, it even has a few sandy deserts, plus it matches up pretty great with the ores you can get. Thanks to this page from Washington's Department of Natural Resources, we can see that they get copper, gold, and uranium also known as radioactive. They also mine iron as you can see here, which for some reason it just doesn't show on that original page. Iridium is a bit tougher, it's super rare, but ores containing it do occur in a few places. One of them is Alaska in the United States, and Washington is about the closest you're gonna get to Alaska in the United States without be it in Alaska. But the nail in the coffin for all of this is the fact that Concerned Ape lived in the state while he worked on Sardu Valley. And I don't think it's too crazy to think he took some inspiration from it. Well hey, there we go. Another one on the map. I'm curious to see what you guys think though. Do you agree with what I've decided or do you think it should be somewhere else? Let me know in the comments down below. And like always, I hope to catch you in the next one.